Hi there, everybody, and welcome to Massabio's um, Oncology Hour talk. Thank you for joining. Uh, today, we are going to take a look at ALK gene fusions and ALK rearrangements and a high-level view of genomic testing as well. Um, ALK is a type of mutation and or a genomic alteration that we're going to learn more about that is the part of many clinical trials and many uh, cancers as, as well. My name is Jason Friedman. I am the pediatric advisor for Massive Bio. I've been with the company for a while, um, and I am a stem cell transplant physician and oncologist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Theodore Leitch, who is an expert in this field, um, an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania and the chair of the Rare Tumor Committee for the Children's Oncology Group. He runs the Developmental Therapeutics Program and the Very Rare Malignant Tumor Program here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, he leads clinical and translational research, evaluating new targeted therapies and immunotherapies for kids with cancer, um, especially high-risk and ultra-rare cancers. He is known nationally and internationally for early phase drug development with a focus on molecularly targeted therapies um, as a member of the Pediatric NCI and COG Match Target and Agent Prioritization Committees. He's also the chair of several studies within the Children's Oncology Group and industry-sponsored trials. So he is an expert in all things, and we are so excited to have him here today. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, why don't we get started and sort of talk about ALK fusions and, and how, what is it and how are they different from ALK mutations and sort of its role with, in cancer? Yeah, so I might just start with a brief introduction to the ALK gene. So the ALK gene is a normal gene that's present within all of our cells um, that's really important for um, the, the development of the nervous system um, in babies. Um, but in cancer, sometimes this gene gets co-opted and turned into an, an oncogene or a gene that drives cancer cell growth. And that can happen in two different ways, as you mentioned. One is an ALK fusion and one is an ALK mutation. So ALK fusions are where two different genes get stuck together, one of those genes being the ALK gene and the other gene being an unrelated gene. And what happens in, that, in those fusions is that that other gene turns on the ALK gene and makes it go all the time, telling the cells to grow and, and turning the cells into cancer. ALK mutations are a little bit different in that they're a mutation within the gene ALK itself, so they don't involve the second gene, um, but similarly turn on the ALK gene when it's not supposed to be turned on and cause cells to uh, grow too much uh, and therefore uh, become cancer. So tell me a little bit about the difference maybe between an ALK fusion or an ALK mutation in general. Are there different kinds of mutations that you see in tumors? So there are different kinds of mutations. The most common um, ALK mutations that we see that cause cancer are what we call point mutations. So they're a change of a single letter within the sequence of the ALK gene, and that turns on that gene when it's not supposed to be turned on. Um, those happen in particular cancers. So um, some cancers, one that we know very well is neuroblastoma, for example, have ALK point mutations that um, frequently drive the cancer. Well, ALK fusions happen in a different set of cancers. So in pediatric cancer, we think about cancers like inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor and anaplastic large cell lymphoma that have uh, frequent ALK fusions. In adult cancer, um, the, the most common ALK fusions occur in non-small cell lung cancer, or the, the most common type of lung cancer occurring in adults uh, have, uh, can have ALK fusions. So these occur in different types of cancer. Um, but there are similar drugs that can block both of these, and so that's why they're thought, thought of similarly. Um, what's different is that you need different kinds of tests, for example, to identify out point mutations versus out fusions, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. Got it. So it seems that these are common in, in adult cancers, but certainly present in pediatric cancers as well. Exactly. Uh, do we know what causes these mutations or sort of what causes these fusions to occur? So... We can describe what happens at a genetic level, the, the change in the DNA within the cell, but we don't generally understand why some people's tumors get an ALK mutation or an ALK fusion and others don't. There are a number of other fusions. We've talked about some of them previously that can happen in cancer, and sometimes the same types of tumors can have, have multiple different types of fusions, um, but we don't understand really what causes, causes those on an on a individual patient level most of the time. There are rare cases where there are familial ALK mutations, so ALK mutations that can be passed down from parent to child, um, and those can lead to 
particular type of neuroblastoma that happens in some children. Um, but most of the time in most cancers, these are not mutations that happen that are passed down, like you think about genetic mutations passing down from mother to you know, mother to son or mother to daughter. Um, these are something that happens only within the tumor cells within an individual patient in the process of developing cancer. So that's an interesting thing. And we've talked about this on other um, webinars that when tumors develop a certain mutation or a fusion, that that could be a targetable thing. And that could be provide a basis for very precise or precision medicine treatment. So maybe we'll talk about that as well. But but first, how do you actually test for alpha mutations? How do you, how, what types of tests are run to see if the tumor has these uh, fusions or problems? So there are a number of different tests that are available and really which test is the best depends on the, on the type of tumor that you have in the clinical situation. So for some tumors, I mentioned like anaplastic large cell lymphoma and inflammatory myofibrastic tumor where these ALK mutations are very common. They're often tested for as part of making that diagnosis and they can be tested for using something called immunohistochemistry where you actually just look for expression of the ALK gene um, based using an antibody. Um, and that test can be very quick, um, or uh, there can be tested by something we call FISH or fluorescence in situ hybridization, where you again look for a specific mutation in the ALK gene. And those tests are really useful when you have a high suspicion that this tumor may, an individual tumor may have an ALK mutation or an ALK fusion in particular, because um, they can test for that particular fusion very quickly. Um, for other tumors where these mutations or fusions are less common, um, we think about different types of tests, in particular next generation sequencing or, or sequencing of the tumor. And that's particularly, I think, relevant for uh, lung cancer, for example, where there can be lots of different types of mutations. And so testing for each one of those individually can be a very long process and actually more expensive sometimes than uh, doing a, a next generation sequencing test that can look for many mutations all at once. And so that's really the benefit of, of what we call NGS or next generation sequencing is to try to identify mutations in lots of different genes, including ALK, but also including a number of other genes that are also targetable um, with different drugs. And so it's really important to understand which of these mutations might be present within an individual tumor. So what I hear you saying is that most of the time when people are diagnosed, their tissue is sent out for mutational testing across the board. And if there are ALK mutations present, those would be um, determined. Exactly. I think most of the time we do do uh, testing across the board. You know, I think when you need molecular testing is something that's not entirely, or when you get molecular testing is something that's not entirely consistent across the country. Um, I, I think there are occasionally tumors that are, you know, very easily cured by resection, for example, a surgery, um, and those may or may not need testing. Um, but I think certainly in the situation of patients who have metastatic tumors or have tumors for which surgery would be very difficult, um, molecular testing is very important um, upfront to try to identify these type of options uh, for patients, both ALK inhibitors, which we'll talk about in a little bit, as well as other targeted therapies for other mutations. Got it. And then if patients sort of are looking for other treatment options or they're, they're not sure if their testing has been done, they can certainly ask their provider. Or if they come to you know a service looking for a clinical trial like Massive Bio, that we can guide sort of, you know, has this been done or not? Um, are there times when this is not a helpful um, test? It's, it sounds like this is pretty helpful and important to do across the board. Yeah, I, I think, like I said, I, I generally, this is a very helpful test. There, are the, the rare situation where you have a tumor that can be cured with a minor surgery and, and that it may or may not be helpful. But, um, but in most cases of, you know, of advanced cancer or metastatic cancer, um, this is definitely a, a helpful test. Got it. So in the vein of precision medicine and sort of identifying these mutations and, and moving from total chemotherapy and throwing the kitchen sink approach to um, we have a mutation, we're going to target it. Tell us a little bit about how these ALK inhibitors or drugs specifically for ALK have changed the landscape of treatment of the various cancers. Yeah. So, so there's a number of different ALK inhibitors and, and they all are similar in some ways in that they block um, either these mutations or the fusions that are turning on the ALK gene. So they turn off that gene that's abnormally turned on and so specifically target that tumor. And they have very different side effects and different uh, toxicity than we think about with chemotherapy. You know, standard chemotherapy really works by killing cells that grow quickly. And so that's why it causes so many of the side effects that it does. 
whereas these ALK inhibitors specifically are blocking the ALK gene. And so they have some side effects because they block ALK in other tissues, but they're generally less side effects than we see with, with standard chemotherapy. So these ALK inhibitors um, work uh, really well for these ALK fusion tumors. And so in a number of clinical trials for lung cancer, for example, people have compared the uh, ability of ALK inhibitors versus chemotherapy um, to shrink tumors. And the ALK inhibitors generally work much better than chemotherapy to shrink these tumors. In some of the pediatric tumors, because they're so rare, we haven't done those same kind of comparative studies, but we have done studies of ALK inhibitors, which have shown that a very, very high percentage of these tumors, usually close to 90%, will shrink with an ALK inhibitor. And that's actually led to recent FDA approval of ALK inhibitors for a, a pediatric type of lymphoma as well that's driven by an, an ALK fusion. So in those cases, these ALK inhibitors have been very active. They, they, they've also shown some activity in ALK mutated tumors, not ALK fusion tumors. In general, the activity has been a little bit less in that situation, but there are still uh, definitely ongoing clinical trials looking at um, the ability of ALK inhibitors to improve outcomes in those patients, sometimes in combination with chemotherapy to try to take the best of, of both of those to, to cure our kids. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of amazing. You go from a, a clinical trial where you're thinking these things might work or some data prior in animal models or other things, and then you say, look how far we've come that these are now the standard of care for so many like the non-small cell cancers. Um, and there are certainly clinical trials in all of those areas with these type of drugs, but some of them, as you mentioned, are now approved in sort of what we call off the shelf therapies. How do people, um, how does one decide if you should get say crizotinib or a first generation or some like a second generation, a different type of ALK inhibitor? Is that something that we need to know more about? Yeah, so this is, there's a number of different uh, ALK inhibitors that, as you mentioned, some of which are now FDA approved and others um, are still in clinical trials. And even some of those FDA approved agents are in clinical trials for other diseases. So uh, the, the area where there's the most FDA approved agents is in non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and in these other tumors, there may not be any approved agents for, for some of these. And, and for some, there's only one. Um, but I think that in general, we think about sort of generations of ALK inhibitors and, and what we think gets better with the second and third generation ALK inhibitors are that they're more potent. So they block ALK more strongly. Um, they also can have activity against some of the ways cancer cells can evade the first generation ALK inhibitors. So cancer cells can have additional mutations that render them resistant to these first generation drugs, but the second and third generation drugs may have activity against those resistance mutations. Um, and they may have different side effect profiles. And so for some people, um, some side effects may be uh, more important than others. And so uh, considering based on side effect profile is also important. Um, I, I, and the last thing I'd mention is there are some differences in terms of brain penetration. And so for some uh, of, of these tumors that can spread to the brain, like lung muscle lung cancer, um, it's important to think about that as well. So I would say the same thing that you said before, that if you're thinking about which drugs are, are going to be best for your individual situation, it, it would be most important to talk to your oncologist and your provider. You can certainly also reach out to, to um, companies like Massive Bio or reach out to others conducting clinical trials to talk about the clinical trial and try to understand what may be the benefits or risks of the clinical trial versus the, the standard of care or, or FDA approved agent. Yeah, since since a little bit of a, a tangential question, but I think an important one, you know, we hear a lot about clinical trials and we focused on this in another um, webinar. But for those joining us today, can you just touch base on our do clinical trials solely mean that it's, you know, all hope is lost and sort of we're in no man's land or are clinical trials actually beneficial um, and could provide a cure? Yeah, so, so so clinical trials don't mean that all hope is lost. There are a number of different phases of clinical trials, and we talked about this a lot before, as you mentioned, but there are some clinical trials which we offer to patients who have newly diagnosed cancer for which they are very likely to be cured, but we're trying to make some improvement on that therapy, either to reduce side effects or further increase the number of patients who are cured. And there's other clinical trials that are trusting very, very new drugs where we don't have a lot of data and, and are usually reserved for patients where we don't um, know of any standard curative therapy. Um, because of uh, all the data supporting the use of ALK inhibitors, 
alk inhibitors sort of fall in the middle in my mind of, of these two age of these two ranges that there are are definitely reasons to suspect that alk inhibitors are going to be active in tumors beyond non-small cell lung cancer including already published clinical trials in other diseases um and so I think um, they're they're not a situation where you have to you know wait until all hope is lost before you consider enrollment on a clinical trial. Um, and some of these clinical trials are designed for for patients uh, who who do still have you know other potential therapeutic options. That's really really helpful, and I think it's a very important distinction and clarification for everybody that clinical trials are actually how we get answers and how we know that things work or comparing different drugs or combinations. And so you, there there are likely clinical trials where ALK inhibitors would be combined with other chemotherapy for newer newer solid tumors or other refractory solid tumors. And so this is how we're going to make those discoveries. So thank you. That's a really, really important um, distinction. We're going to um, start taking some comments from the audience in a second. So throw them in the chat box um, if you have them. Um, but do you think that can you give folks sort of a, another parallel? I was thinking about, you know, larotrectinib and sort of like ALK and ALK inhibitors, sort of a little bit of the story of, of larotrectinib and how in those cancers, a targeted agent is just a super advanced way of, of getting to a cure. Yeah. So, so as you know, I've done a lot of work with, with larotrectinib, and, which targets a different kind of fusion in cancer, call it an intract fusion or a tract fusion. Um, and it, that in many ways is very similar to to alg fusions. It's a different gene, and so we need a different drug to target it. Um, but um, but it occurs in similar types of cancer. Actually, it occurs in non-small cell lung cancer. It occurs in tumors like inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor in children. Um, and so um, again, to me, that really drives home this point of, about the benefit of broad molecular testing for some of these diseases because. We don't, there's no way currently to know which of these genes may be driving a cancer just by looking at it under the microscope. And so we need to, we need to test and treat these tumors. But, but like ALK inhibitors, you know, larotrectinib has shown a very, very high um, response rate. So a very, very high percentage of patients have their tumors shrink um, with larotrectinib therapy. Um, and, you know, we've just started looking at data about whether or not we can actually now stop larotrectinib for some patients whose tumors are responding. And in some cases, we can, we've can we seen that, at least so far, when we stop the drug, the tumors don't recur. And so we're hopeful that for some patients, this may um, you know, enable us to, to offer curative therapy for some patients with tract fusion cancers. That's, that's really amazing and encouraging. And just sort of the field is moving so fast. And and again, like, you know, simple example, like an infection, you want to get the most specific antibiotic to treat that infection. For cancer, you don't just want to throw everything at it. You want something that's very targeted. And I think that's where we're moving and it's exciting. So thank you for all your work in that area. Um, one of the questions I'm seeing um, from an audience member is, how do I find clinical trials for ALK fusions? I mean, I think we've already discussed that between companies like Massive Bio can help you certainly take your intake and get you 